Communities struggling to reopen to find some sense of normal in the new normal as the coronavirus continues to shape our lives. Today, how Arvada and Lakewood are working to keep their cities well and running and how they are keeping the great outdoors in beautiful Jefferson County safe. Hello, everyone, and welcome again to The Conversation. We are again assembling a program from outside of our studios as our communities and our country continue to struggle with the coronavirus. I'm originating from my South Metro home today, and we have three terrific guests for you. We'll be talking about our summer do's and don'ts list with health and medical expert, Dr. Pyle Kolish. She's agreed to squeeze us in between patients this morning, and we appreciate it. From Arvada, we will be joined by Parks and Urban Design Manager, Emily Sexton, who will be telling us how Arvada has decided to manage the reopening of public spaces in Arvada's vi vibrant communities and neighborhoods. And from Lakewood, Amber Westner, the Public Engagement and Operations Manager in the Community Resource Department. Lakewood has already had to deal with some very big crowds at the, for example, the very popular Bear Creek Lake Park. And I think everyone's been surprised by the big crowds that have been showing up uh, in parks all over the metro area. We kind of guessed that since a lot of us have been uh, sheltering in place for so long that maybe there would be pent-up demand, but it's really been uh, quite a remarkable surge. So welcome to all of you today. And Dr. Pilly, let's start with you. Our list of summer do's and don'ts, a list of things that are safe and maybe not so fit safe uh, for all of us as we continue to work uh, to avoid getting ill and to uh, stay healthy so that uh, we can uh, fend off the virus. And I'll begin with those activities considered safe uh, and then have you comment on them. So first of all, Let's talk about our low risk activities. The first of those being vacation with another family. And I guess if you know the family, it's a fairly low risk thing, but maybe not. This is a tricky one, Mark, but you bring up a good point. So I asked myself three questions when you think about planning your summer vacation. It's who are you going with or who's gonna be there? Where are you going and how are you going? So the first question is who are you going with? And as you pointed out, if it's just one other family that you're going with, and you and that other family have been going steady like you do in middle school, you've only been seeing each other, not seeing a lot of other families, then that's probably considered pretty low risk. On the other hand, if it's a family or a big family that you haven't, you don't know their activity patterns or they've been seeing other people, then you might wanna be a little more careful. How are you going is the second question. Are you flying? Are you driving? How much contact are you gonna have along the way in your travels? How long are your travels? Are you having to switch planes in different cities? All of those are things to think about when you're planning your summer vacation. And then the third is where are you going? So at this point, I would not recommend a trip to Florida, to Texas, to Arizona, <laughs> or to California, despite how lovely those states are, because those are hotspots of infection. So you really wanna try to plan a trip that's going to have the lowest risk. So now we know that outdoors, are safer than indoors. So this end of the spectrum in terms of the safest trip you could take is a camping trip, for example, with one other family and you've only been seeing each other and you know, you're know you driving in your own car and you're not making a lot of stops along the way. On the other end of the spectrum is a long plane flight to a crowded resort in Florida where there's lots of people coming from different parts of the country and you're having you know to take a long flight and you're going somewhere where the disease activity is going up. I know uh, Texas particularly is seeing a huge uh, surge in the virus, and that brings us to the question of rental cars, uh, which uh, was initially listed as a low-risk activity, but with surges in California, Texas, Florida, all these states, are rental cars as safe or low-risk as we might think? You know, in general, I would say rental cars probably are safe because we know that the primary mode of transmission is person to person rather than through surfaces or what we call fomites. But having said that, to your point, if somebody has been in the rental car just before that's got you know, a high degree of infection and they've put their droplets everywhere, one of the most important critical things you can do when you pick up your rental car is leave the windows down for about three hours and wipe down everything everything you might touch and you know we touch a lot more things than we realize in the car the steering wheel the gear shift the door handles the rear view mirror the the radio controls everything that you might possibly touch you need to wipe down and i would say for the first day or so in the rental car make sure to keep sanitizing your hands just in case there's an area you may have missed i personally am now terrified of hotels as well which would be the next step and i know a lot of hotels have big ad campaigns about all the extra cleaning that they're doing and they have a no 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 touch keyless entry system now. All these 
new ideas, but I've read a lot about uh, 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 people worried about pillows and sheets and surfaces in the hotel room. And I'm wondering if that's as low risk as we might think. Again, hotels are another one of those areas where potentially you could have a lot of contaminated surfaces. So I think the most important thing is to understand the science of how the virus spreads. And we know that it lasts much longer on hard surfaces like countertops, televisions, remote controls, than it does on soft surfaces like pillows and sheets. So what I would recommend if you have to stay in a hotel, don't freak out because it is on the lower risk of the spectrum. But I usually would ask the front desk person to maybe give me a room that someone hasn't stayed in for the past two or three days if that's possible and when you get into the room make sure you wipe down especially those hard surfaces countertops remote controls doorknobs lampshades switches those types of things and then the soft surfaces i don't worry as much about so as long as the sheets have been freshly laundered and no one else has slept in them you know, I think it's unlikely that you're going to catch the virus from the pillow or the sheets. You may think about deferring housekeeping while you're there, which sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but it's one less person coming into your room that's gone into other rooms. So you might say no to the housekeeper coming in. And then if you're going to go into any of the of the common areas like the pool, the ice machine, anything like that, make sure you wear your mask. And I tend to avoid the elevator altogether and use the stairs. Not only is it good exercise, it also prevents you from being in that space that everybody else has been in where they've touched a lot of the things. Great tips. That's very comforting. Next, they're swimming at the beach, and we're going to hear a lot from Amber, uh, Western Lakewood, about the huge crowds at Bear Creek Lake Park. I mean, it, it was just astonishing, and uh, she's going to talk about how they were having to deal with that, but we've also seen incredible pictures in Florida, uh, the, uh, the Panhandle beaches, the Gulf Coast beaches, huge crowds there as well. So what about swimming at the beach? Which they, they say it's low risk, but I can't imagine in some of the crowds we've seen that it is. That's what makes me worried. So if you went at 2 a.m. to swim at the beach and there was nobody else around, it would be low risk because your chance of contracting the virus from the water is very low. We don't think the virus is really transmitted through water, uh, especially fresh water um, and, and pool water. We know that chlorine and bromine can actually inactivate the virus as well. So that's less of a concern. But the social distancing, as you point out, the fact that there's so many crowds on the beach makes it very challenging. The fact that your face is wet and when your face is wet, the fit of the mask actually changes, as does the efficacy of the mask. So if you go swimming in the water and then come out onto the beach and put your mask on, number one, it's not going to work as well to filter stuff from getting in. And number two, it's going to be a little more uncomfortable to wear because it's humid, it sticks to your face, and things you know won't allow you to breathe as well. So you're less likely to wear it. So I do worry about beaches just because there are a lot of people there. So if there was a way that you could enjoy the beach or enjoy swimming with maintaining that strict social distancing, that would be a safer recreational activity to do this summer. Okay. And outdoor seating at, at restaurants, we're seeing a lot of that now. Absolutely. Safer, so safer I, I, outdoor seating is absolutely safer than indoor. And at this point, I wouldn't be comfortable going for an indoor restaurant, but I certainly would be comfortable going outdoors. The tables should be at least six feet apart. You should make sure your waiter's wearing a mask. And if you're meeting somebody who you haven't seen in a long time, I actually recommend not sitting directly across from them as we normally would because our droplets tend to travel the direction of our head. So you would want to sit kind of sideways from them a little bit so that their droplets are not coming straight at you and vice versa. Try to touch as few things as possible, like the menu, you know, the bill, things like that. But if you do happen to touch anything, touch the table, make sure you sanitize your hands often, especially because you're going to be eating and you may have finger foods at the table. So you want to make sure those hands are nice and clean as you're eating. Wow. This is, I need to make myself a list to, uh, to keep track of all of this. There's a lot. These are our medium risk activities. I'm going to combine outdoor sports and swimming in a pool because those kind of go uh, hand in hand. Both of them involve close contact with other people. So outdoor sports with your, you know, you're throwing around a baseball with your dad or your brother, completely safe. When you start to get groups of people together, that's when I get very nervous. And I know that Governor Polis has said gatherings of less than 10, but I have to be honest, even that number of 10 makes me nervous because 10 is a lot of people and you're then coming into contact with everybody that they've been into contact with. So I would say inner circle, sports activities, your family, maybe, you know, one other friend or few other friends who are only seeing each other 
probably okay to do. But if you're starting to get a group of people together to play basketball or soccer or anything like that, I have to say that makes me really nervous. The swimming, I'm actually a little more comfortable with, again, because if we're following social distancing, the pools are restricting how many people can get in there. You know, you're very unlikely to actually catch anything from the water. But social distancing in a pool is more challenging. So you do have to be mindful of that. Okay. We have backyard barbecues listed as a medium risk activity, but I guess it depends on who you're with, right? That's exactly right. I would actually say low to medium risk for that one, because if you have, you know, just your one family over that you're going steady with and it's in the backyard and you're maintaining social distancing, the only thing you have to be mindful of is if you're sharing food, you don't want to touch common utensils. You don't want the serving spoons to be the same. So maybe make two separate pots of food or maybe make sure everyone's using a different set of utensils because that's a potential source of contamination. Okay. We already know you're not a fan of indoor seating at restaurants. Uh, Outdoor is preferred. But in public restrooms, uh, there's a lot of discussion about uh, uh, the aerosolizing uh, of water in public restrooms, and you even recommend wearing your glasses, in a, your sunglasses in a public restroom. I do. So public restrooms make me nervous for a few reasons. One is because they're usually small, so social distancing is hard. Second is the ventilation systems, believe it or not, most public restrooms are not that great. And then the third is a lot of recent data has come out about when you pull the flush or the toilet, you can actually aerosolize about 6,000 particles into the air, and 40 to 60% of them can go as high as six feet. So two things happen when you aerosolize particles. One is you contaminate surfaces all around the stall, whether that's the toilet seat or the door handle or the latch or what have you. And then the second is some of those aerosols can get suspended in the air so that the next person that comes into the stall can potentially inhale those or have contact with their eyes with those aerosols. So I have a few tips for potentially what you can do to reduce your risk. So the first is to certainly wear your mask the entire time that you're in a public restroom. As you said, Mark, you may wanna think about wearing glasses or some kind of eye protection, especially if you're going into a crowded public restroom where somebody has just been in the stall before you. I tend to avoid going into a stall immediately after somebody else, you know, give it a few minutes. Don't touch any of the surfaces inside the stall with your bare hands. So I use toilet paper to latch the doorknob. And then if you want to lay down, you know, a toilet seat cover or toilet paper on the seat as well, if you're sitting down, that's a good idea. And then wash those hands really, really thoroughly and try to just minimize the amount of time that you're in the restroom. So it's not really a place now to loiter, to hang out, to talk. You just get in there, get out and get out in the open. (laughs) <laughs> wow, that's a terrifying scenario. And it's it's listed as, as medium risk, but maybe it should be in our high risk category with haircuts and air travel. Let's talk about uh, uh, salons, hair salons and nail salons. I know uh, every woman in my life wants to get to a salon. Myself included, I have to say. My hair is getting too long, but... <laughs> That is definitely on the high risk end of the spectrum. And the reason is because not only do you have close contact, you also have prolonged duration of contact. So we know it's not just the closeness, but also the duration that affects your infectious risk. Um, So if someone's coming close to you, they're touching your hands, they're touching your face or touching your hair, that's also a high risk type of contact. So I would say, you know, hair salons, nail salons, if you can defer them, you should. If you're in the high risk group, try to find alternatives. But if you can't avoid it, then you definitely need to wear your mask when you're going in there. And again, the eye protection has been shown to add an extra layer of protection. So if you want to put on your sunglasses or something when you're getting your nails done, again, you look a little silly, but it does offer some protection. And then you really want to keep talking to a minimum while you're in there because talking spreads aerosols. And normally we're in the habit of talking when we go out to get our hair done or nails done. But this is not one of those situations you want to be doing that. Well, you say that a mask can offer 85% of protection. I think you said your number is 85% and that glasses add another layer beyond that. So masks can reduce risk of infection by 85%. The homemade masks are um, not not 85% efficacious at preventing droplets, but they reduce the spread of infection by 85%. And exactly right, the Lancet study found that putting on eye protection Uh, They were looking at face shields, mostly for medical providers, but goggles work as well, offer an additional layer of protection on top of that. Well, amazing. So certainly uh, air travel, uh, our last uh, our last item on our list uh, and still uh, not on any list that you've made so far about acceptable behavior. 
Yeah, air travel, if you can put it off, again, I would advise you to do so. But if it's necessary or you absolutely have to go, then there are ways that you can make it safer. So social distancing on a plane is very challenging, but the better, the more you can do, the better off you're going to be. Try to avoid using the lavatory just because it is a small space. And even though planes are really doing a good job of trying to keep it clean, you know, it might be challenging and still have some contamination. If you do have to use the bathroom, make sure you wash your hands with sanitizer really well afterwards. And interestingly, Mark, they've found that window seats are actually better than aisle seats in terms of risk of infection. And that's because you're having less contact. As you're sitting in the aisle, more people are walking past you. And so you're potentially exposed to more droplets. There's also the air patterns in the aisle are slightly different from those in the window. So if you can try to get a window seat without anyone in the middle there, you know, that would be the best case scenario. And like I said, try to keep that mask on as much as you can. If you have to take it off, you know, to eat or drink something, then that's okay. But if you can avoid it, uh, I would recommend doing so. Wow. Wonderful advice. Dr. Coley, this, this show uh, needs to be required viewing. Uh, and I'm sure that our parks people that we have coming up from Arvada and Lakewood uh, would say the same given what they have experienced. So thank you so much for your time today. I know that you have patience and uh, you can just uh, lay it on me if you're a little late. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me, Mark. It was my pleasure. All right, great. We'll see you again, Dr. Coley. Thank you very much. Well, let's hop to uh, to our public officials who are trying to manage all of this and are doing a terrific job uh, in Arvada and Lakewood where they are seeing just uh, enormous crowds. And uh, Emily, let me start with you. I, I was expressing to uh, uh, Dr. Coley that uh, I know that where I live, I was astonished by the early crowds, uh, the, the first appearance of those crowds. I guess that people were uh, tired of being uh, in their homes, but uh, where I live out here, out south here, it was just an amazing rush. And I'm wondering if you were surprised by that when you first saw it uh, there in Arvada. You know, before this new normal, um, community members used bars, gyms, restaurants as their primary gathering spaces. And now that gathering and recreation space has transitioned to our parks and trails. So I wouldn't say that I was necessarily surprised at the, the sheer number of uh, people in the parks, but you know, one reason it hasn't been too overwhelming from my standpoint is that the peak use time has changed. So um, people have more flexibility in their schedules working from home to use facilities throughout the day rather than just before and after work. Um, but at the same time, there is increased use across all time of the day. So um, it's, it's interesting that the community is starting to understand the value of public green space and you know, how we need to prioritize making our facility safe for everyone. Right, exactly. And Amber, I know that you had huge crowds at Bear Creek Lake Park. We talked about it. Uh, just uh, just an incredible thing initially. It's a, it's a popular uh, place anyway uh, on uh, weekends, but, but now more than ever, it has become a popular place. And you actually uh, had to manage some big crowds out there. Yeah, so it's, it's been very difficult for the Lake Road Community Resources Department because our mission is to bring people together. We want people to come and, and live, work, and play in Lakewood and to enjoy those outdoor spaces. And at Bear Creek Lake Park, one of our regional open space areas, we typically see over 600,000 people a year with obviously the summer season being our, our prime season. And as the pandemic took off and to second Emily's comments that we had already closed our museums, our rec centers, all of our indoor spaces, all that was left was, was our trails and, and outdoor areas. So we expected some level, but we were experiencing in early March um, summer level, you know, mid-July weekend level attendance at Bear Creek Lake Park. And at Bear Creek Lake Park, for those who are not familiar, there's a really beautiful swim beach. Um, the lake is called Big Soda Lake. There's a lot of paddle craft that's enjoyed on that lake. And we realized very quickly that we didn't have the resources available to manage the crowds and ensure that everyone was being safe, social distancing, wearing their masks, those not congregating with people outside their household. So what we had to do was shut down several of the amenities in the park. We, we kept the park open. We wanted people to be able to enjoy the trails, but the visitor center, the campground, and the lake amenities had to be closed down until we could figure out how we were going to manage those crowds. And so what we ended up doing from there was developing a signage campaign that we used across the city. We are all in this together, six feet apart, and really encouraging folks to take care of their neighbors, not, not only themselves. 
and we, we have added additional park rangers. We've added um, community service folks as well as Lakewood PD. And, and their mission is really to educate first, emphasize how to stay safe if you aren't familiar with the best way to keep yourself safe, and, and then enforce only, only when needed. And of course, we've seen even more enforcement action at Bear Creek Lake Park. It continues to be a very popular place, and that will probably be an issue all summer long, I'm, I'm guessing. Emily, I'm wondering, how are you accomplishing this in the city of Arvada? Amber is talking about extra signage and extra enforcement. How are you making that happen in your city? I think that the biggest encouragement tool that we have is design. So one example is how we've changed our maintenance practices. Um, we may, in a typical season, mow a three-foot strip along um, our, our native grass area on our paths uh, once, maybe twice a season. But now in order to encourage users to stay the six-foot recommended distance apart, we're changing our operations to mow more often as a safety measure. Another example of that is, you know, changing how we've done things in the past and how we can adapt for the future. So as you know, many events have been canceled due to COVID. So our special event coordinator, coordinators are changing uh, the events that she normally organizes to virtual events, um, experimenting with drive-in events, uh, just, just getting creative with um, learning how to adapt and, and being able to still provide services to the community. Right. Such a tall order. Uh, I'm uh, wondering, uh, Amber, uh, how are you encouraging people, besides signage, are there, is there a, another way to encourage people to wear masks? Dr. Coley has pointed out that's so important, 85% uh, reduction in infection rate with a mask. And I know I still see an awful lot of people who are not wearing them. Well, one of the ways I think you can encourage that, while, while it's not required in, in most areas, um, in our signage and in our campaign, we make sure that we say to wear a mask. So if you come into one of our facilities, we, we want you to wear a mask. Um, we aren't going to give you a citation if you don't, but we, we, we are asking you to please wear a mask. And, and in many cases, especially um, some of our youth programs, we will provide the mask for you if you don't have one. Um, we also are making sure that in our in our facilities that are gradually starting to reopen now that we have good distance amongst folks. So if you think of a rec center, when we reopen our rec centers, we're making sure that those areas are divided up and there's a pretty good distance between people as they recreate within the building. So you would make a reservation to enjoy a certain portion of the building. You would have you would be encouraged to wear a mask. We would um, allow you to use that facility for 75 to 90 minutes, and then we leave breaks in between to make sure that we're disinfecting. So even if mask compliance isn't ideal, we're trying to make sure that we enable people to be safe just by nature of design, as Emily was commenting earlier. Right. Uh, such a tall order. Uh, so Emily, here we are. We're still marching forward in the reopening process here. Uh, are you are you worried the crowds get larger and uh, more unmanageable, or do you think you've pretty much got a lid on it now, seeing now how you've had some practice with the initial crowds here? Yeah, we have had to turn away some groups applying for special event permits that don't meet health order qualifications. Um, you know, unfortunately, this is peak season for event schedules, and while there's impacts on people's plans to have weddings or 5Ks or annual events that they've planned for months, um, you know, we're erring on the side of caution to keep people safe. But I think for the most part, uh, there's been cooperation and understanding from everyone in the community. Right. Uh, Amber, I'm, I'm wondering, um, are, are you anticipating extra pressure uh, on your on your parks? Uh, I, I think we're looking at a long summer here, what we've seen in other parts of the state uh, and the country, uh, mostly uh, in, in the warm weather states, Florida and Texas, the uh, all the Gulf beaches and what have you, as we were talking uh, about with Dr. Coley. Are you expecting more pressure or do you think that people in Colorado are doing a pretty good job, particularly people in Lakewood? I think in general, people in Colorado are doing a, a pretty good job in, in Lakewood as well. I, I do think that we have to be very strategic and careful as we open to help people succeed. We are bringing on additional staff members to help with that education piece. And, and I hope that as we are are careful with the resources we have available and, and to open things very slowly that people will be mindful of others and those that are high risk will be sure to stay stay home. If you have symptoms, don't don't come in, don't enjoy um, public spaces. Just just be careful and, and take care of yourself. But 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 also if you are a healthy individual and not concerned, 
please make sure that you are wearing your mask and being careful for others. I know the CDC and Dr. Fauci are saying that we could uh, still be easily six to eight months away uh, from a vaccine, and that's a long time to remain inside. But I had a doctor tell me, you know, really, you don't you don't get a chance to to uh, make a mistake if you are already medically compromised. It's just so important that you uh, remain indoors. But you can understand the pent up demand to get out. Yes, absolutely. Right. And I saw something else really interesting, Emily, from the National Tourism Board. There is a list every year that shows the most popular cities for tourism. And Orlando is always at the top of that list because of the theme parks. But of course, the theme parks are doing staggered openings or restricted openings, uh, smaller crowds. They're limiting the crowds. Tickets for July at some of these parks are already gone. So as a result, other destinations are going up the list. And Denver right now is number one on the list. And Jefferson County is high. Uh, in the places to visit because Jefferson County is an outdoor playground with no ticket limits. So I'm wondering, are you worried about a, a surge of visitors from other places across the country where perhaps coronavirus is surging as well? At this point, no. Um, you know, the only thing that we can do is watch and assess the situation as it unfolds. So I, I'm, I'm not one to be very reactionary um, right off the gate. Obviously, because this is a safety concern, we need to be really careful in monitoring the situations, but um, at this point, it hasn't come up as an issue in Arvada specifically. Yeah, well, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Uh, both of you live in such picturesque areas, and uh, I know that Arvada and Lakewood are always high on searches for people who are looking to uh, come here. Um, I, I, I was wondering, I, I think, uh, Amber, we were talking about uh, your staff. Are you still looking to hire people? Are you still looking for additional people to monitor parks? Um, we have. We are in the process of bringing on people to um, increase our park ranger staff. Um, we have we have been really strategic and fluid with our with our staff resources, especially those seasonal and part time employees. When we've had facilities that have been closed, we've been sure to spread people around so that we can utilize them in other areas. For example, if a rec center is closed, several of the recreation staff have started to work in parks or work at the golf course. And so we, we've just been really strategic about how we use um, the, the staff resources that we have so that we can keep all those facilities open. We can continue, continue to educate and um, just be fluid. The, throughout this pandemic, we've had to be fluid and be able to, to react as needed and keep those places outside that people want to enjoy available to folks. Right. Amber Wesner in Lakewood, you are a wonderful guest. This is terrific information, I think, for the residents who live in your community. Emily Sexton in Arvada, the same for you. You guys uh, have a big job. And let me just say that we, we your public, uh, appreciate your efforts on our behalf. And uh, I hope you both stay well and healthy across the summer. And maybe we can check in again as the season goes forward. Thanks to both of you. Thank, Thank you for so having us. You bet. You bet. And to Dr. Pyle Coley, thanks to her as well. We want you all to stay healthy and follow the rules, rules when you are outdoors to keep not only yourself, but those around you safe and coronavirus free. Thanks for joining the conversation again. Everybody stay well.